Welcome everyone to another episode of Active Perspective Podcast. In this episode, we take a look at the underlying framework of critical race theory, or CRT, and our understanding and response to racial and ethnic disparities in the U.S. We discuss what CRT is, its ties to colonial history and systemic practices of power and privilege, racial and ethnic discrimination, aggression, and stigma. We look at political controversy of recent bills across the U.S. that largely restrict how such history is to be taught in public schools, along with the fears and functions of such bills. We analyze the relevant arguments against CRT, what they are and how they function, and we also discuss how we can best address racial and ethnic disparity using behavioral science. Along these lines, we discuss our ethical obligations as practitioners, educators, and clinicians, and where we go from here. With me today are three panelists with notable backgrounds in the fields of behavioral science and psychology. Denisha Jingles is a duly licensed graduate professional counselor and behavior analyst who currently resides in Maryland. She is a clinical director and CEO of Signature Behavior Analytic Services, an executive board member of Black Applied Behavior Analysts, co-founder of Black Girls in ABA, and co-creator of Beautiful Humans Change, a platform and podcast dedicated to fusing social justice and ABA. She is a social justice activist and community organizer whose key issues include criminal justice reform, education reform, and racial justice. She facilitates anti-Christian workshops, is a scholarly writer as well as a highly sought keynote and international speaker, and currently serves as a guest editor-in-chief of Behavior Analysis and Practice, which is an official journal of ABAI that provides science-based best practice information relevant for practitioners and applied behavior science. Dr. Esther Calzada is the Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion and a Norma Clay Levin Professor in Child and Family Behavioral Health at the Steve Hicks School of Social Work at the University of Texas at Austin. She also holds faculty affiliate positions in the Population Research Center in the Lee List Benson Latin American Studies and Collections at UT Austin and in the Department of Population Health at the New York University School of Medicine. She's a clinical child psychologist with expertise in parenting and early childhood development among ethnic minority, particularly Latino families. Her program of research focused on family and intergenerational processes and interventions aims to reduce racial and ethnic disparities in academic achievement, behavior problems, and socio-emotional problems. Funded by the National Institutes of Health, the U.S. Department of Education, and the National Science Foundation, her work advances understanding of the unique risk factors that undermine healthy child development among Latinos, as well as the protective and promoting factors that offset such risk. Dr. Jonathan Tarbox is the co-founder and program director of the Master of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis program at the University of Southern California, as well as the director of research at First Steps for Kids, specializing in improving the lives of children diagnosed with autism and related developmental and behavioral disorders. He's a past editor-in-chief of the journal Behavior Analysis and Practice, a board member of the ABA Task Force to Eradicate Social Injustice, and a member of the advisory board of the Women in Behavior Analysis Conference. He has published five books on applied behavior analysis and autism treatment, is a series editor of the Elsevier book series, Critical Specialties in Treating Autism and Other Behavioral Challenges, and an author of over 90 peer-reviewed journal articles and chapters in scientific texts. His research focuses on behavioral interventions for teaching complex skills to individuals with autism, acceptance and commitment training, and applications of applied behavior analysis to issues of diversity and social justice. Now, without further delay, I bring you Denisha Jingles, Dr. Esther Calzada, and Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for being part of this dialogue. Um, as we begin, but before we get into the specific questions about the analytical and, and functional framework, for understanding racial and ethnic disparity in the US, um, its criticisms and possible solutions, if you would. Um, take a moment to say something personal about yourself, your personal journey, and why you do what you do. Uh, starting, Esther, if you would start. Yeah, absolutely. Hi. Um, 
So I'm happy to introduce myself. I'm Esther Calzada. Uh, I'm a clinical child psychologist by training. And um, I am currently a professor in the Steve Hicks School of Social Work at the University of Texas at Austin, where I also serve as the Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion. And um, I guess my kind of very brief you know, story about why I do what I do is um, that I grew up in an immigrant household. Uh, I am, my parents are both uh, immigrants from the Dominican Republic. So I grew up speaking Spanish and uh, very much kind of insulated within an immigrant community um, while also being, you know, attending English speaking mainstream schools. And so um, I very much grew up by culture, by cultural in, um, in the state of Florida and also spending a lot of time in the Dominican Republic. Um, and that was a very natural, normal, kind of unquestioned way of growing up and forming my identity until I kind of left home and, and entered higher education and started getting a lot of questions about who I was and, you know, why did I look the way I look or why did I speak Spanish or what Dominican even was. Um, and when I entered grad school, um, I became interested and as I became increasingly aware that all of the things we were learning in, um, in the field of psychology, or most of the things we were learning, were really um, leaving out families like mine. Um, and so I became interested in, in focusing on uh, immigrant families, Latinx families, um, and I've done a lot of work with families from all sorts of different backgrounds who are non-white. Um, and that uh, has kind of spurred uh, 20 years of both professional and personal um, kind of exploration of what it means to be a person of color, um, what it means to be have an immigrant background, um, and how all of that is really steeped in issues of justice. So. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan, you want to go? Sure. So my name is Jonathan Tarbox, and I'm the program director and co-founder of the Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis program at the University of Southern California here in Los Angeles. Um, really excited to be here today and I appreciate the invitation. Uh, I think this is gonna be an engaging conversation. Um, uh, just briefly why I do what I do, um, I guess you could encapsulate what I do as uh, try to help people do hard stuff in general, whether that's uh, parents of uh, kids with autism, um, uh, engaging their kids in, in therapeutic interactions, uh, or whether it's people increasing health behaviors to get their get their lifestyles a little bit more healthy and, and constructive. Um, and more lately over the last few years, uh, trying to figure out what the heck we can do in applied behavior analysis to move towards social justice and, and, and greater equity within our field. Um, and so uh, that's sort of, I guess, in a nutshell, what I do and um, ACT, our acceptance and commitment training is, is, I guess, the tool that I use for most of this stuff that I've, that I've found most useful. Um, and so, yeah, I'm excited to be here. I think this is going to be a great conversation. Thank you. Denisha? Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Denisha Jingles, and I am based in Baltimore, Maryland. I initially grew up in St. Louis, which I think um, has had a lot to do with why I do what I do. I grew up in a predominantly black area and we we just had a very um, different understanding of the way that the world works. Um, it wasn't until I went to college that I actually started to put those things together, um, recognizing what it was like to be um, othered on a predominantly white campus, seeing signs on our campus that the black population had to rally against telling us to go home, knowing that um, the KKK had the ability to march on our campus just a few years before we started going to school there, being called the N-word while crossing the street. And I think for me going um, to that school, I just was really confused. Like I didn't understand why people behaved in this way if, if we were supposed to be in a new era. Um, and so that got me to wanting to study it. And so I um, joined an institute to learn a little bit more about how oppression worked, um, just so I could understand the experience that I was having and that my friends were having and that we were responding to on in this on the campus. Um, and so that was my first 
understand or my first experience really of heightened racism, um, which led me to say, this isn't right. And um, from there, I went on to grad school, I always knew that I wanted to help people and psychology was my path. Um, I began doing ABA as my first job in the psychology field. I didn't really connect with the science at that time. I knew I was good at it. My supervisors loved me. And I continued to move on to be a mental health therapist. It wasn't until I did ABA for the third time. And during this time, this was 2014, we were in a new heightened social justice movement. Um, Trayvon Martin had been uh, murdered just a few years prior, like, and then 2014 was Mike Brown. And during this time, I was working as a behavior specialist and also was a social justice activist. So for me, things started to merge together. How can the science come together to make a better world? And I was really, really curious about that for the longest time. And that's what's led me to this point in trying to draw the connection between building the better world that we believe can be possible um, and using behavior science to do it. So that is... is the abridged version. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. A little bit about myself. Um, so I started in behavior analysis a little late in my life in child protective services, both in field uh, supervision and administration. You know, it was early 2000s when I, I was sitting in the regional administrative team that we dove into racial disparities uh, in child welfare. And that really woke me up. Um, I never really had a question. Of course, I, I never had a question about uh, this, the color of my skin, what I was getting before. This really was uh, mind blowing because across every single domain in child welfare, there was significant racial disparities. Um, not only in, in, in who was called in, but how it was investigated, um, what services were offered and uh, who was removed, um, what parents had to do to reunite with their children, if the siblings were placed together or, or placed separately, um, how long uh, children stayed in, in uh, the foster care system, uh, the number of placements. Uh, it, it goes on and on. And, and at each stage, it has a dramatic effect on the welfare of of the individuals as they grow into young adulthoods. And so when they age out of, out of, out of uh, foster care, which is, there's a great disparity there. There's, there's a whole bunch of stats that just show decreased well-being for the individual. So um, anyway, so we had a very progressive uh, assistant commissioner at the time that we, we got into undoing racism uh, training with People's Institute for Survival and Beyond out of New Orleans. That really opened my eyes and knowing who you are training, uh, which is uh, about children of color and, and the foster care system. We read a book uh, called Shattered Bonds by Dorothy Roberts uh, um, that had a significant impact. So all these kind of impacts created to turn my life. But at the same time, I realized that when we were, when we were trying to continue on to the dialogue, that there was a silent majority. Uh, that most people didn't talk um, when uh, in groups and they kept silent um, for whatever reason, that seems to be a problem across the board, including behavioral science. So I'm finding that, yes, uh, there's, some, there's some dialogue, of course, going on, but um, not nearly enough. And, and I'd like to see a lot of the diversity trainings go beyond the superficial. So that's my story. Um, Denisha, uh, let's start with you. Um, I have some stats here I wanna, I wanna read. U.S. Department of, this is from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Compared to their white counterparts, African-Americans are generally at higher risk of heart disease, stroke, cancer, asthma, influenza, and pneumonia, diabetes, HIV, AIDS, and now COVID-19, where they are twice as likely to die. 
black women die at three times the rate of white women when giving birth, twice as likely not to have health insurance, black women, uh, men and women live shorter lives on average, about six years uh, shorter. Uh, black female students are six times more likely to receive out of school uh, suspensions. Black and Hispanic unemployment rates maintain among the highest in the nation and are often left out of high paying jobs. Uh, the median income is the lowest of, of all of the races, uh, which is on average 40% less. Uh, black wealth is on average 90% less, not to mention black community is eight times more likely to be incarcerated. So in nearly every stat of well-being in the US, there are clear racial, racial and ethnic disparities. You wrote a recent journal article uh, entitled Igniting Collective Freedom, an Integrative Behavioral Model of Acceptance and Commitment for Black Liberation for the Journal Behavior Analysis of Practice. Uh, where you are co-editor and where you say that uh, the biggest threat to black liberation is structural racism and infer that the proper framework to understand this is through critical race theory. If you would, uh, can it summarize your article and define what you mean by the framework of critical race theory and structural racism, if you would. Yeah, sure. Big question. Um, I guess. I guess it's a huge question and I'll try to um, summarize my article as concise as possible, but it's a very long article. So I'll just start off by saying, please read the article for anyone that's listening. Um, too. Yeah, um, but essentially this article was my plea to analysts to really consider the psychological and behavioral impacts of racism, structural racism on the Black community. Um, as you mentioned earlier, Hugh, there's not a lot of movement within behavioral science that actually takes an active stance on mediating um, these concerns. And to, uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is the first article that exists to say specifically we have work to do for the Black community within behavior science um, and for towards liberation, right? And so um, with this, I utilize pre-established frameworks already. There's, there's nothing really that is um, new within this. It's just pre-established uh, frameworks that work together. So there's um, an acceptance and commitment component. Um, there's also some RFT relational frame theory that is embedded into this article as well. Black psychology, which are which are the frameworks in which I pull from to understand um, a lot of our plight um, and a lot of what we need. Um, there's also a trauma informed approach that is within this article as well. Um, and the plea here, like I said, is for us to consider the science, the technology that we already have at our fingertips that could uh, potentially serve as a way to help not only actualize Black liberation in the structural context, but Black liberation in the psychological context as well. Thank you. Yeah. And you asked uh, me about CRT, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, just if you would, uh, just kind of briefly, what is CRT uh, and and how is structural racism uh, part of that? Yeah, definitely. So um, CRT was established in the late 70s, early 80s um, by law um, legal professionals. And it has, it rests on a few different tenets. And so the first tenet is that racism is normal like it's actually it's normal meaning that a lot of times when we talk about racism it's this abnormality like oh no this shouldn't exist or oh wow I can't believe this one person did such a thing but with critical race theory the tenet is that actually it's it's ordinary it's not extraordinary as we may think that it is and that really gets on the embedment of racism into the society. The next tenet is that white is supreme, right? So white takes the cake or white is right. And what that tenet rests on is that based on 
the way that the world behaves, we understand that whiteness is prioritized. And so racism advances the white class, the white elites, the working class people as well, the white working class as well. And so um, this particular tenet then goes against what we were taught to be, which was colorblind, right? This colorblind tenet that we all have the same opportunities available to us um, and we can respond to each of our own communities in the same exact way. So that is one tenet that the, the whiteness is right type of tenet goes, or the white is right tenet goes against. Um, the next one is social construction, that race is socially constructed. And from an RFT perspective, right, there's some verbal relations that we have um, regarding um, your hue, my hue, um, and, and so the social construction that we've made it up, that we have these rules related to skin color. Um, and another tenet for CRT is context. So my life um, is gonna be different as a black heterosexual woman, right? Versus what, some of my peers who might be black, but also queer. Um, versus your um, matriculation into life as a white male. And so understanding intersectionality is one of the main tenets of CRT as well. And then lastly, but not least, lived experience that when people are labeling their actual daily experiences that that should be part of the ways in which we are teaching the impacts of race and what that looks like for people in their day-to-day -day lives. And so um, breaking down critical race theory in that way, it actually doesn't seem too far-fetched to even like right now there's a lot against CRT, but it, it, there's nothing about it that's like um, shell shocking to me because um, you know, we do understand based on even the uh, facts that you said already, Hugh, racism exists in a way where people are having different experiences in the world and we have the data that shows that. Um, Jonathan, do you wanna, do you wanna go? Sure, sure. Um, and just uh, first to piggyback off of what Denisha said, um, I really, uh, have been woken up to the value of CRT. Um, and, and what I really appreciate, largely through Denisha's work and, and her colleagues actually, um, but what I really appreciate about it is that it, it's a perfect fit with a behavior analytic view of racism, which is that it's a, a, a social construct and that it's learned um, and that race, <clears throat> race is not a real thing out there in nature um, other than how we are learned to be uh, learned to respond to it um, it's socially constructed it's learned verbal behavior uh, and it's complex um, and that if you think about it that way of course it's normal of course it's everywhere because it's not a personal trait it's not like person a is a racist and person b is not a racist um, all humans that are, are raised and socialized in a culture that teaches discriminations on the basis of race, all of us are trained to be racist, some more than others, of course. Um, but then uh, it does, of course, make sense that it's normal. Um, and then, you know, the important thing about that is that it's all of our responsibility. It's not just the responsibility. You know, the other, the old colorblind way of looking at it is, oh, that, you know, that crazy, you know, redneck white guy in a white cone hat, it's his problem. We got to just put him in jail and then we'll be fine or something like that, right? Um, and CRT and just behavior analytic perspective uh, reminds us, no, it, it's all of us. It's all of our problem. Uh, and so it's all of our responsibility to do something about it. And so after George Floyd was murdered and we saw uh, this massive change in our culture, because you know Black Lives Matter had been around for years before Floyd was murdered. Um, but a lot of uh, mainstream white folks, I guess, in, in, in American culture sort of thought of it as sort of an extreme sort of fringe movement maybe, you know? Um, and something really special happened after Floyd was murdered um, that a lot of us white folks woke up and realized this isn't, a specialty thing that we need to, you know, that just a few of us can be concerned with, right? This is structural, this is systemic. It affects all of us. It's part of who we are as a people. Um, and so in that moment, when uh, I think a lot of 
folks in our culture, uh, including a lot of white folks, were like kind of like desperately uh, wishing that we could do something. Uh, and also for white folks in positions of power, we're also noticing this is actually not our turn to be leaders. <laughs> we need to shut up and we need to listen and we need to use our, our power and our privilege to amplify the voices of others. And so um, uh, I think it was within just a few days after Floyd was murdered, uh, there was a lot of talk on social media of what can we do as a field in behavior analysis. Um, and at the time, I was in, in an, an enormous position of power and privilege as being the editor in chief of the journal Behavior Analysis and Practice. Um, and we had just wrapped up, uh, or we were in the midst of, I don't know, um, a, a special issue on COVID-19. Uh, and, you know, I realized like, is there something more important than systemic racism? Is there something more important than doing something uh, to move our society towards equity and social justice? Um, I don't think so. We need to do something. And so the thing that I could do was empower others to make a contribution uh, through the journal. And, right, and literally at the same time that I'm having these thoughts and talking to my wife about it, Denisha, I know what she's doing. She's cooking up um, action, social action within our field. And she posts a challenge on social media, like behavior analytic journals, do something about this now. Like now is your moment. <laughs> I it, was a, you. It, was, it was a convergence. You yeah, were, it was you really were cool. working separately in Canal Tech. Yeah, so Denisha, I don't remember if you emailed me first or if I emailed you first, but... Uh, my thought was, we need someone who is an activist, who is a hardcore behavior analyst, really well trained in ACT and RFT, hopefully, um, and who is willing to step up to the challenge of leading a special issue on, on racism. Um, and so I sort of prayed, silently prayed that Denisha would volunteer because she's so busy, she's so active. Um, and it worked. And, and Denisha put together a team of uh, co-guest editors to help her out. Um, and she, uh, she led the charge and, and made it happen. It was, um, and, and we're still wrapping it up. It's not done yet. It's a lot of work, <laughs> uh, but that's, that's sort of where that came from. Cool. Cool. Uh, sir, do you, uh, uh, you want to chime in about that question about CRT and, and structural racism? Um, sure. I, I guess I would say that, um, you know, the CRT is, um, a lot, like Jonathan said, actually, for me was kind of an aha moment of like, wow, this really helps me understand so many issues in a deeper um, and more holistic and more true way. Um, and so I've very much appreciated kind of uh, leaning into CRT and its teachings. Um, and I will say like, just having been socialized as a white person, despite being um, brown, um, being labeled brown, right? I've been, I've been named brown by society. Um, I've been socialized as white. Um, and it is, uh, I have to say it's, it's a process, right? Because it's just a really um, different way of thinking about things. And it really challenges what we've, believed and thought um, to be true, you know, whether implicitly or explicitly, whether consciously or unconsciously for all of our lives, basically. Um, and I think that that's, uh, you know, it's tapping into the structural racism piece. I think that's one of the really tough navigation points here is kind of how do I as an individual fit into these systems and structures? Um, and CRT helps us understand, right, that, that it is about structures and systems, but of course we're the players in those structures and systems. Um, and so it leaves us grappling with all sorts of things um, about who we are, what we do, what we uphold, um, what we accept and what we don't. Um, and so I am very much, uh, you know, of course, I'm very much a proponent of CRT. It's very useful to me in my work um, and in my role uh, in higher education. And I understand um, how it really takes quite a shift for folks. Um, and I think that that's mostly for folks who, um, who are white or who haven't been confronted with issues of race um, and ethnicity in a very personal way, but also for all of us in some ways. Um, 
So I, I wanted to also add, because, you know, for people who have a hard time, like understanding structural racism, individual racism, right? Um, structural racism, all those things work together. So you have the public policy, you have the institutional policies, you have the ideologies that all work together to keep those inequities um, present for different races. And, and so that is the embodiment of racism and how it embeds into the, the culture. And I think you also said it, Esther, it's like you can uphold the system without even being overtly aware of you are, you know, working to maintain it. And so that's going to be based on, it could be your private events, it could be your overt behaviors, but also the environmental stimuli that's embedded into our uh, society. And another thing with um, racism and trying to understand it is there has been, in, in different spaces, this downplaying of the role of individual racism. And I understand it to the extent but when we mythologize the system, right, we make it this omnipresent, all-knowing, ever-existing type of uh, thing, then it becomes impenetrable. We can't change it, right? And so because the system exists, then racism must exist because the system wills it to. And that, that's how we get into like that circuitous way of thinking no, we actually make up the system though. People make up the system and individuals create the policies, individuals maintain them. And so that's where our individual responsibility also comes into play. So um, if we start looking at it from like the Skinnerian perspective and cultural selection, we understand how individual behaviors and collective behaviors work together on a specific society. And so um, I wanted to kind of like bridge that together for those who are like, well, the system exists. So, you know, there's not too much we can do about it. I can't do anything about black people not making the same amount uh, as white people because I didn't hire them myself, but it's, we're all, you know, these interlocking contingencies, we're working together to maintain the system. Um, and so whether they be smaller behaviors or larger behaviors, the perpetuation of the larger structural issues exists through that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Also, to uh, to uh, want to touch on, I think it was Dr. Kier Bridges, and she is a law professor out of Berkeley, and she had distinguished between individual race or what we what we had always defined as racism prior to the civil rights movement as uh, individual discriminatory acts that. Um, that was overt and there were bad actors. Uh, and now it's more subversive. It's, it's uh, we can see that it's, it's uh, embedded into our, our institutions and there's a lot of implicit racism that I don't think that people uh, understand too well. Like how can you, are you calling me a racist? I didn't do any, I'm not a racist. Um, we'll touch, uh, on that later in terms of the criticisms of CRT, because there are quite a few criticisms and misunderstandings. Um, I want to ask you briefly, uh, you, Jonathan and Denisha, did you receive any backlash as a result of uh, those, those journal articles? You want to go first, Denisha, or me? <laughs> um. Yeah, not not as much as I guess one probably expected, but we, you know, we definitely received, you know, some some feedback. Um, and starting the starting this series, I had a lot of things that I wanted to make sure happened. And the first and what was first and foremost for us was centering black voices. Um, a lot of times in in academia, you have the white peer review process, you have your white editor, they get to come and they say, well, I don't believe this to be true. I'm gonna actually tell you to go look from a different perspective. And so for me, I wanted to make sure that we were being true to the science, but also being true to the black community in which lived experience trumps all. If, you know, if there are specific wording that the black community is using, this needs to be converged inside of 
our literature as well, because that is socially significant to our community. And um, so, you know, there were certain things that I put in place, the decapitalization of white, which is directly against the APA. The APA still has the capitalization of white, um, and, but black scholars have called for the decapitalization, which shows, um, which they have linked to, you know, white and white supremacy. And so um, decapitalizing that um, in our journals, that also was a thing where authors were like, well, the APA wants me to, to capitalize this. So what do I do? Um, and you know, at the end of the day, we left it up to them, just gave them the information that these are what black scholars are saying. And majority of the authors decided to, to move forward and do that same thing. But um, in terms of pushback from others, I won't go into like the specifics, but I'll just say, yes, there was pushback, whether it was the language that we used that was a little bit too radical for some of the readers um, or just not understanding the need of the series to begin with, there was pushback in, in that type of way. But it was really important for me that, you know, I had a, a very strong foundation to stand on, which is my years of actual organizing and activism. And I felt like at the end of the day, I was going to make sure that I could walk any of these papers into my community and, and show this to my fellow organizers and activists and that they would say, okay, this, this is right. And not, what did you do here? You allowed them to whitewash our experiences for the sake of academic publishing. Um, so that was really, really important to me. So regardless of the pushback, we pushed back further. <laughs> so, so yeah. Yeah, and I'll say um, there was maybe like literally one or two voices that, that had, that, that well, that, that voiced uh, pushback to me um, and like hundreds of voices reaching out saying, thank you for doing this. This is awesome. Thank you for supporting this. So um, I would say, and, and part of that might be a function of my privilege. Maybe not a lot of people are going to approach me and, and give me critical feedback. I wish more would actually, <laughs> it's, it's useful, um, but uh, very, very little pushback. Um, and so I, you know, was encouraged by that. Although I have to say, uh, I was following Denisha's lead the entire time. And Denisha is one of the most fearless activists I've ever met. And basically her stance is like, we're willing to die for this. Like, go ahead and try to take this from us. This is what we're doing. Like, <laughs> give it your best shot, you know? Um, and that, uh, Denisha, your courage gave me permission to think like, gee, like if she's willing to be that courageous, how can I not? Like, go ahead. Like, Give us, give it your best shot. Do, do what you will to try to uh, uh, stop this. Uh, we're doing this for our field and we're doing this because we need to do this now. Um, and so, I don't know. I, 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 I was actually expecting more pushback. Yeah, definitely. It wasn't, it wasn't a resounding pushback. Um, I, even though I don't get messages that say like, oh, thank you for doing this. Like I never get those emails. Are you but serious? I never for get real? those I promise you, I never get those emails. Um, but um, I didn't get like an overwhelming negative response either. Just a few, a few bad actors, like you're saying. If you. <laughs> well, let's move on, um, Esther. I, I'd like to ask you. Yeah, you know, let's move on to um, what's currently going on in in the law and schools. Um, uh, with racial and ethnic uh, politics and public education, you recently wrote an article in an op-ed piece for the Austin American Statesman uh, in response to a recently passed Texas legislation that largely restrains how race and racism is taught in schools. Uh, HB uh, 3979 in Texas was signed into law on June 15th of 2021 um, by Governor Greg Abbott banning the teaching of concepts related to critical race theory, but also governors in Idaho, Tennessee have some signed similar bills. And I think that there's 12 other states that are pending legislation. Um, can you discuss what's in the bill and what the fear is of critical race theory? Sure. Um, so this bill is um, 
is aimed at K to 12 curriculum um, in the teaching of history and social studies and history. And it starts by just listing, um, you know, the, re the required content of the curriculum. So these are the things that, you know, by the time kids um, graduate high school that they should have learned about and includes, of course, the history of slavery. It includes women's suffrage. Um, you know, it just lists those topics. And it is followed then by um, restrictions for educators. And some of the restrictions are um, around what teachers are allowed to do in their classrooms with students. And those are focused on things like, you know, teachers have to avoid discussion of current events. Um, so of course, George Floyd, you know, like <laughs> that comes to mind as an example of something that would very appropriately um, and powerfully be, be used in high school classrooms as um, a, a topic to, uh, to discuss with students. And, um, that that is prohibited. Um, it's also teachers are prohibited from encouraging students through things like um, prompts or offering extra credit um, for engaging in uh, political advocacy or, or activism. Um, it also bans trainings for educators um, around race, racism, anti-racism, CRT. Um, and then what I find most interesting and, and probably kind of the meat of where CRT is and isn't, um, because this is a ban of CRT, but not really, um, is uh, kind of a set of assumptions is, is kind of how I think about them, uh, that teachers, uh, that educators cannot endorse, I guess. Um, so they can't imply, for example, that, um, you know, a group of folks based on their race are racist. Um, they, they can't, uh, have conversations that um, that make students feel discomfort or guilt or shame based on their race. Um, and I will say actually all of these are, um, they're explicit to both race and sex. Um, and again, clearly they're, um, they're targeting CRT in this. Um, and so it's, it's both, um, you know, very much like clearly in response to CRT and also pretty pretty vague and also um, really off the mark in terms of understanding CRT in, in, in my opinion and I think in the opinion of a lot of folks. Um, and CRT is never actually named in this bill. Um, it's never explicitly stated that, you know, CRT is banned from, from schools. Um, you know, I think this speaks to uh, a, a lot of fears. Um, and especially the fear of just being uncomfortable. <laughs> I think for a lot of people, that's actually what this is. It's uncomfortable to grapple with issues of race um, and racism. And of course, you know, that, that's true for everybody. It's true in a very different way for white folks because white folks never personally have to grapple with these issues. And, and because they have that privilege, then, you can avoid it altogether, right? If you aren't confronted with it. And I think this is a way of just saying, we want to keep that, right? We want to maintain that um, privilege of not having to grapple with these issues. Um, and so I think that, you know, whenever we are challenged in what we know to be true about ourselves, about our society, um, it, you know, that feels really uncomfortable. And um, I think it also kind of plays into these fears about, uh, you know, anti-nationalism, for example. And so we can think of it a little bit more globally, maybe. Um, so uh, CRT does ask and, and grappling with issues of racism, these are hard questions, right? Like, what if we start to ask, like, whose land do we occupy? That's a really hard question to, to grapple with. Um, you know, what advantages have people had, have I had based on my race and based on my sex? Um, you know, what about our heroes? What about our historical figures? Like if we think about Thomas Jefferson, if we think about Abraham Lincoln, all these people who we really want to and have lifted up as heroes, if we look at them more closely, right, we have to understand them in more nuanced ways. And I think that that's, that just feels really uncomfortable to folks. Um, and that's what people are trying to avoid through this. I think that the more cynical response is that there's a fear of losing power. So, um, you know, 
if, if we think about a truly just and equitable society, which people in a post-racial set, people who kind of buy into like this colorblind post-racial narrative are saying like, we, are, we do live, racism is a thing of the past. We live in um, a, an equitable and just society. If that were true, right, then power would be equally distributed amongst folks as well. Um, and you just look at any example, right? If you look at Congress, like three out of four members in Congress are white. Three out of four members in Congress are men. 90% um, of the Senate is white, right? And so power is held by white men predominantly. Um, and so if we start to think about this and look at it through the lens of race and sex, but um, then it challenges to, to question like, you know, is that truly just and equitable? And because it's not, that is the conclusion. That means that if you are a white man or if you're invested in the power or success of a white man, <laughs> um, you have to step aside because there's no, you know, there needs to be room for others. Um, and so I think that that fear um, kind of at a, it, at, a, at a level of those who are really kind of behind the scenes and crafting these bills <laughs> it is the fear of, of losing power. Yeah. I, I can imagine right now someone who's more conservative would be really gritting their teeth right now. Uh, and this opens the door to a lot of uh, criticisms of CRT and quite a few people um, that are real prominent on the airways and written many books uh, one is Glenn, Dr. Glenn Lowry out of, uh, he's an economist out of Brown, uh, Dr. John McWhorter, uh, who's a linguist and English professor out of Columbia. Both have written several books, um, not to mention uh, Jason Riley, Coleman Hughes, I mean, the list goes on and on. When they all argue is that racial discrimination only accounts for a small percentage of racial disparity that we see today. The majority of what we see today are the deficient, the social and, and um, educational deficiencies that we see in uh, the culture in those communities. How would you respond to that? Would you like to go first, Esther? Um, I can tackle this a little bit. I mean, it. this argument makes me think of, um, you know, this, this culture of uh, poverty kind of uh, narrative that emerged, I think in the 1960s, I think started by a New York Senator named um, Moynihan, who, who basically was like, hey, listen, folks live in poverty because of kind of how, <laughs> how they, what they believe, what they value, how they act, right? This is really um, about, folks' preferences, traditions, um, and how they're socializing their kids. Um, and it outlined kind of all of these uh, values like, um, I am more present oriented, right? Living in poverty, I'm more present oriented, so I'm not saving for the future. Um, and so it really shifted, right, the, the narrative um, about poverty and what keeps folks in poverty from that of limited opportunities um, to, um, and you know, all of the kind of structural barriers to lifting yourself out of poverty um, to one of like, well, if you're more future oriented, um, if your work ethic was different, if you valued having two parents in the home, right? And that's where we, we came up with like this, or reinforced probably, these were not new ideas, um, these narratives that, that poverty um, and these big social issues, right, are um, related to individuals um, and, and really not individuals embedded in systems. Um, and so I, I um, when I think about these critiques of CRT, I, I think that they're, they're expected, like all of these really challenging big social issues, <laughs> Um, I have these debates and, um, and I think they really kind of fall into these categories of, is this really about systems and who we are as a nation or is this really about you? <laughs> and the easier answer 
is to say it's about you um, because then it's your responsibility to change it. And it's not mine. Um, and it's not mine if I'm in power, right? Um, and it's not mine if I'm your neighbor. <laughs> um, it's really just yours. And so, um, yeah, I guess I would say my, my response is um, that it, it, for me, it's completely disconnected from um, a lot of empirical evidence on um, what causes poverty and what keeps people in poverty, what um, the effect of racism on health, physical health, mental health, well-being, educational outcomes. Um, it's really disconnected from all of that evidence, um, in my opinion. And I'm also just, um, you know, I, I think this is how this plays out because um, there there are just really more comfortable ways of um, understanding issues of race. Misha? Uh, yeah, no, everything that Esther just said. Um, also think the argument, especially if we're talking about the community, I think it um, starts from a very earlier conversation of eugenics, because if you're placing this back on, well, Black people just can't um, excel because it's the way that they believe or the way that they render their children, then there's something inherently deficient about Black people is the equivocation I think is being, um, or the the argument that's being made without actually saying it for that individual. So, um, you know, like Esther said, if, if we are able to put the onus back on the community and we don't have to consider our own feelings as the larger um, society, then that might be the easiest um, thing for us to do to approach it is to just say that it's the way it's the values that this community um, holds it's the way that they render their children it's the um it's the way that they teach them versus actually um it's the way that we've set up their environment uh, for them to succeed or not to succeed and i think one thing that gets lost even for that, if we put back the failings on the parents, is do we forget that the parents were also once children? So where does this all begin then, right? Um, so yeah, I think that we it's we have to be able to actually look at those environmental contingencies versus um, going back to like a eugenics type of argument um, that it's just this particular community's own issue because that's just the way that they are. Yeah, I think the pushback. Now, when I looked at your paper, Denisha. I didn't see anywhere in there that said, hey, um, we got to wait um, and do nothing until white people uh, end racism and the structural racism, and then we can, then we can move. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about how the argument is framed. And Glenn Lowry, and I read his book, uh, The Anatomy of Racial Inequality, which is a very, very good book. And he, he describes, you know, yes, there is institutional racism. Yes, racism exists. And yes, it has led to racial stigma, both within the individual and within the, the community. So these disparities that we see are a result of structural racism, but we're not accounting for the deficiencies of where um, racism has led. He describes uh, an example where um, Black students who are sent to the office at a higher rate, right? And, and, and CRT, said, he says, would be describing that as, as discrimination. Rather than, he says, uh, these Black students um, are condi socially conditioned to not fit in to the school system. Sure, I would ask if Black kids are not socially conditioned to fit into the school system, then and the rest of everyone else's condition, then what do we need to change for the environment? Like, why? Yeah. you know what I mean? And I think, honestly, from a behavioral perspective, we, we can actually just call farce on that immediately. Like, we know that we have the ability to change environments that, um, you know, produce behaviors that are workable for people within certain um, situations or environments. So we know that. So saying that, you know, a child doesn't fit into an environment, okay, then that means it's up to the rest of us to figure out what to do to fit them into the environment, right? Or to fit the environment to them, actually, not to fit them into the environment, right. but to fit right. them into right. the environment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then you also take two, I mean, uh, 
uh, the alt-right taking what's said and then kind of twisting it or cherry picking to say, ah, see, there's, he's saying that there is no racism that exists. You know, the thing is get your act together, pull yourself up by, by your bootstraps. I do it every day. I earned what I have and I didn't get anywhere where I am due to white privilege. I got where I am because of hard work, determination, and making all the right choices. Well, um, I mean, it, it's, it's a classic thing, yeah. I think, going back to the ancient Greeks to just blame the organism. So if an, if, if an individual is performing particularly well, you put the cause inside that person. They must be moral. They must be industrious. They must be intelligent. Um, if an organism is not performing particularly well in a circumstance, you put that cause inside them. So they must be lazy. They must be immoral. There must be something wrong with their culture, you know, which is essentially what that argument boils down to. Um, and that's not to say that there, you know, that, that, that there's no room for personal responsibility. Of course there is. But where do you think people learn personal responsibility <laughs> from their environment? Like if we want to foster more personal responsibility, it's still up to us to alter the environment, to provide better social supports, to provide more effective educational systems, to provide, you know, uh, to, to help lift people out of poverty. So it, it's still, it, it still doesn't hold water. I mean, if, if you want to just blame people so you don't have to take any personal responsibility for contributing to the, the system of, of structural racism, then that argument works great. When, when people make that argument, do they know what they're saying? Are they well-intentioned or are they misguided or is this malicious? I was going to say, you know, we can take a function-based approach and understanding from our science where it's going to be up to the individual that people have different reinforcers um, present for them. So for others, it might be, I, and this is actually also in the article too, it could be, you know, that I receive social praise from my white counterparts. I also have the ability to gain access to more money versus if I, you know, said something else um, or, um behaved in a different way and so I think individually it really matters for that person and not painting a broad stroke that like everyone does this because they know what they're saying they know what they're doing or they don't know what they're doing um you know it, it could really really depend on the individual person what their consequences are typically for that you know for these um sets of behaviors yeah. Yeah. Sir? I was back on a previous point, which I, I was just going to say that this argument that, um, you know, I've worked really hard for my success, um, you know, and it's not, I'm not successful because I'm white. Um, you know, yes, there, I, I don't begrudge anybody their hard work and I don't think anybody does, right? Both things can be true. You can have worked very hard and you can have gotten advantages um, in our society because you are white. Um, and so I just, that's, that's one thing I was reacting to and why uh, maybe you saw me unmute um, before. But I guess to the issue of kind of, are, are folks malicious? And you know, where do people stand? I, I think there is a range, of course. I mean, you know, folks are all over the spectrum on this and how they feel about it. And, um, but I also think that folks are all over the spectrum in terms of how conscious they are about a lot of these things. Um, and as we are, I think as a nation, like really trying to shine a light on this and, and increase consciousness about this, um, even then I think it is, it takes a great deal of intentionality and effort and, and presence and mindfulness to really kind of um, be attuned to all of the nuances of how um, these issues play out. And so um, I, I would say that, um, you know, I would hope certainly that most people are not malicious. And I think a lot of the backlash around CRT is that people are saying we are not bad people. <laughs> um, and and I, I, you know, I have no reason to say that that's wrong. Like I, I agree, most people are good people. Um, and, and, and it takes a lot of work, right? To really understand, recognize, interrupt, disrupt, um, lift up, right? All of those pieces. And so um, I think a lot of this falls kind of in that range of, you know, not quite aware or growing awareness or trying to be aware, but it's just, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and moving on. Um, so uh, the last question. Um, so given that we have a steeply divided nation, um, now where do we go from here? What is our responsibility within behavioral science, within the helping fields to, uh, to address this issue? Jonathan, let's start with you. Sure, so uh, uh, I really have um, learned a lot in the last couple of years and I feel embarrassed and, and a little bit sad actually for the lost time that, that I've experienced. Uh, uh, you know, just to be fully frank that I've cared about these issues a lot, haven't really done much or enough. Uh, and it kind of actually, uh, for me, did require Floyd being murdered um, to, to wake up and to take more personal responsibility for, for what I can do and, and for what all of this means for my career and my, my daily activities and my opportunity to contribute. Um, and so, uh, it's unfortunate that that it, that it took that for a lot of us white folks, um, but also I'm happy to be here now, and um, and I've found new meaning and purpose um, in my career, uh, just kind of reflecting on what matters more than equity and social justice within within our field, um, and I can't think of something that matters more. I mean, I used to really focus on like helping individual families, like if I've helped one child with autism, I've made a difference for that family. And that's true still, that, that doesn't go away. But then if I just take a step back and say, what if almost all of those families are upper middle class white? Like, what if there's a disparity in, in the families that I'm helping? Is that okay? Does, or, or does that diminish my contribution in some way? And for me, the answer is clear, it, it, it's not okay. Um, if, there's, if there's systemic and structural racism underlying everything that I do as a professional, um, I'm not satisfied with that. And I personally take on the responsibility for thinking about planning, self-reflecting and engaging in committed actions towards addressing that disparity um, a little bit every day. Uh, and so I'm not gonna tell other people what they should be doing, but um, Denisha's paper, if they just read it, uh, is a great model for how to just self-reflect, identify what we really care about and make committed actions and, and just take a step every day. Um, and really for me, it was about moving from color blindness to a more anti-racist position, which is, it's, it's my responsibility to, to do something, mm -hmm. um, to identify inequities and do something about them. So for example, if you know, I run a master's program at USC, I used to just sort of lament, oh, it's really a shame that we don't have enough black applicants to our graduate program. If we did have enough applicants, I would accept them. You know, I mean, obviously if they're qualified uh, and we weren't, you know, oh, well, that's such a bummer. You know, the opportunities there just apply. And, and after learning more about anti-racism, I realized, no, actually, if I care about that, that's a disparity that I can address. So I can take over committed actions towards getting the word out there towards recruiting, towards connecting to more communities of color uh, so that more black folks know about our program and might be interested in applying. Um, I can try to address the economic disparities by creating scholarship programs, by fundraising to, to support tuition, um, so on and so forth. And I'm not trying to take credit for anything I'm doing. I'm just saying like right now, uh, literally every day, my expectation of myself is spend some time and effort and some money <laughs> um, towards behavior, over behaviors, towards addressing social justice. And I think that we can all do that, all of us. And maybe it's even more incumbent upon those of us who are whiter and more male <laughs> and have more privilege. Um, but even those of us who consider ourselves the least privileged, we have choices every day. And, and we do have the opportunity to, to take specific actions towards equity and social justice. Denisha? Yeah, oh, everything. So I was, I was kind of like smiling as you're talking, Jonathan, because um, I think that is how we respond and use the science. I did uh, a presentation in 2018 on ACT, and I remember I learned from, I learned about ACT from Jonathan and Evelyn Gould, and um, it was the same weekend that I first got my introduction to act where I had the aha moment like this is 
this can be useful. Um, and what really, really matters is not just, you know, we talk about being able to do the hard things. ACT is gonna, ACT really helps us to be able to do those hard things. Um, but also the committed action part of it as well, that it's not enough for us to just say like, oh, okay, I'm gonna be a little bit more flexible here, but how does that show up in our behaviors? And um, using that technology for us to be able to do so. And it's the day-to-day -day things that really matters. Recognizing power and privilege also matters in that. Um, and so, you know, being able to dial back self as context, right? for that as well and to say all right well here i am in this position and so this is how i can utilize my position to better um, the experience of others um, i also think for behavioral science we have the ability to take a function-based approach to addressing racism um, as you said earlier that the cynical uh, response or the more cynical response might be that, you know, white males don't want to give up their power. I actually think that's the scientific response. I think that's the behavioral understanding. Like we have to look at the function of racism and there's, there, there is a function to it. And I think when we do that, you know, we're looking at the actual consequences of racism for white people, which it might be what, which it is access to power, access to money, the ability to set our social standards and norms, housing, healthcare, all that stuff, the list goes on. There's absolutely a function to it. And I do think that we have the ability to really study that and dial that back to help inform the rest of the world when there are these um, uh, conversations about, you know, well, that's just one person who has a thought process of Black people, and that doesn't really um, speak to how racism works in the larger society. I think that we can take a function-based approach and say, actually, maybe we see it differently um, there. So I think ACT is really powerful for, um, potentially powerful for um, addressing racism and all its impacts on the um, uh, uh, communities of color, but then also white folks. I think that white folks have their own work to do. And I always say that's not my work to do. Even though, you know, within the past couple of years, white folks have found utility of my work um, in that way. I also believe that there is more room for different white professionals and practitioners to utilize ACT to talk to one another. You have a very different experience than I do. So when I'm talking about psychological flexibility, it might be just a bit different than your psychological flexibility and what it's like that you've matriculated through life and you've been socialized as white versus me being socialized as a black woman. So um, I think that that's, um, we, have, we have some good, tools and technology at our fingertips. Thank you. Esther? Yes, 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 yes <laughs> to all of it. I mean, I, I think the, um, you know, the theme of like, this is work on a personal level, this is work in my professional role, um, that really resonates with me. Um, you know, it, it ties back to this question of like, this is systemic, but we are the ones up, upholding the system. And, and that means, right, that each one of us has a role to play in order to move forward and, and make change. And, um, and so I, I think about like, you know, what is that? I, I like the daily focus, very intentional daily focus Jonathan describes of like, what can I do to disrupt today or to uphold or to uplift, right? Um, and that can take a lot of different shapes. I think sometimes that feels really big and overwhelming and maybe scary, um, but it can be that, you know, today I'm only buying from black owned bookstores or, you know, I'm, uh, you know, when I'm reviewing a journal article, I am like challenging these assumptions about, um, you know, the white norms that are uh, steeped in academia. Um, there's so many different ways that that can play out, I think. Um, that that can be feasible and then it becomes really just you know you have that mindset you have that lens of you know how am i helping to shift um this system right um because it's not going to be a seismic shift it's a, uh, or i don't imagine it to be um and and so that that does help i think uh to put it back in our hands um and to help us feel some kind of control over it and um so I, I think that piece 
gives me hope um, to kind of frame it in the sense of like small daily acts, kind of like when we talk about, you know, happiness and practicing gratitude, you know, like it's, it's a habit, it can be a habit. And I think it's, it can be just a way of, of looking at things, understanding things and making more intentional choices. Would, um, do you have any resources that you uh, think that people would like to look at? My podcast that I haven't done any episodes in quite a while um, is Beautiful Humans. And so if you go to beautifulhumanschange.com, there's actually a long list of resources on there. There's some behavioral resources as well. Um, and then also some from activists who put out reading lists and things like that for people to learn more about CRT, just um, in equity in general. Um, so yeah, beautifulhumanschange.com. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Are you? I, I can add that um, I, there is a, a program that um, was developed right after uh, the George Floyd murder out of University of Florida's counseling psych program called Academics for Black Wellness and Survival. Um, and what I love about that and why I recommend it is um, because there is a whole set of rich resources for white folks and, and not but folks who aren't black who are doing this work and separately um, resources for black folks who are engaging in healing and resistance. And so um, it has an academic bent, but I think that, that um, for a lot of folks who are listening in, I think that would be um, relevant and really useful. And I'd like to plug a, a book that was just recently published that uh, it's a collection of essays on uh, compassion and social justice. In fact, I think the title is framework, scientific framework for compassion and social justice. Uh, Denisha published two essays in that book and, and I wrote one for it. Um, and uh, it, it, it's a really rich resource for how, uh, for ideas and, and practical strategies for compassion and social justice. Um, and then I'd also like to plug the, the special issue that Denisha guest edited for the journal Behavior Analysis and Practice. So folks can uh, uh, go to the uh, website for Behavior Analysis and Practice. And um, a lot of the articles are available for free download there um, and really check them out. It's a rich resource. Um, and Denisha has put an incredible amount of work along with her colleagues um, in editing that special issue. And we're really, really proud of it. Thank you. All right. This was awesome. I've learned uh, an incredible amount in this in this whole journey. And I thank you all for your time and, and your insights. It was really, really valuable. I hope that this um, this contributes to the conversation. So thank you very much. Spit on the ground, hold your breath, try to scare yourself to death. Bury your bones under the dirt and tear at your heart and rip your shirt And stomp your feet in disgust Curse the gray skies if you must But you'll find when you are done Blue skies for everyone and Take up your wine, break your heart And give up the race before you start Drop your drawers and roll around Burn your house right to the ground Go to sleep your head, screaming till your face is red, but you'll find when you are done, blue skies for everyone, blue skies, setting sun, cherry pie.